Testing one, two, test one, two. Testing one, two, three, test one, two. Super, super, too much? Oh, okay. Yeah, you can turn it down. Make sure it's just not distorted. Because I'm not talking that loud. Test one, two. <laughs> oh, don't worry. He's separate from the rest of the room. <laughs> test one, two, testing one, two, three. Really? It's that high? It's hitting the red? What's Nick? What was Nick doing? Sorry? Oh, something changed overnight. Okay. Yeah, so he's ox two, so that's test, 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 test. Testing one, two. Can you, can you, do you have headphones there? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it's probably blown out. Yeah. Testing one, two, test one, two. Testing one, two, three, test one, two. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, good.
Uh, we'll be starting in, in about five minutes or so. from the podium. Okay, so then I'm going to come up here at some okay. point to press this. Okay, so it's all queued up, I think. Okay. Oh, but Debbie has to introduce you. Yeah.
Good morning. Good morning and welcome. We're preparing to begin our day's conference. Thank you for your patience. Um, we've been holding while our colleagues are making their way here. Uh, my name is Debbie Douglas and I will be your MC moderator for the day. So you're going to see me popping up and down um, here. If you have any questions, just uh, grab me or grab one of the folks at the registration desk. It is so good to see so many faces coming back from last night. Did, for those of you who were here, wasn't na last night a fabulous um, panel? Yeah, and Amani Omar, that young dynamic poet, we're going, certainly going to hear a lot from her, um, who closed off the evening. So we are off to a very good start. Just some housekeeping. Folks at the back, you know, I, will, I am going to ask you to move a bit closer so we don't all bite. So we're a bit, co we're a bit cozier. When people are speaking from the stage, it's really nice when they see folks that are closer to them as opposed to all the way at the back there. So yes, my brother over there on the left, please move a bit closer to the front. Thank you. Some housekeeping. Um, you, many of you have already found it, but we have some refreshments, some light uh, food and drinks downstairs on the first floor. That's where we will be serving all of our meals uh, throughout the day, so please help yourself. Washrooms are just out the door and to my left. Uh, all gender bathrooms are on this floor. There are other bathrooms on floor one where our breakout sessions will be happening this morning and this afternoon. Um, we also have a multi-faith room in the law school. It's, um, it's, it seems to be complicated to get there, so let me, let me tell you this. Um, it's located on the lower level of this building um, in the basement, which you can access by going down the stairs and taking the door that attaches to the Jackman Law Building and Flavo. If you need help finding the room, please just ask someone at our registration desk or at the law school's reception desk, which is located on this floor um, in the atrium area. Um, there is a sign as well outside this room with all of the breakout rooms, so the name of the workshop and which room it, it will be held. All of the workshops are on the first floor of this building. Our filming and photography policy, and we need to say this, um, registration means consent in our case. So by registering and attending, you have consented to be photographed and to be videotaped. We promise that it will only be used for color of poverty, color of change purposes. It will never be used for commercial purposes, and we will not um, flash it across the world. Um, if you do not want to be photographed or videotaped, just please talk to the photographer. Um, and, and, and they will respect your wishes. Um, we are absolutely hoping that you will be engaging on social media throughout the day. Um, please use the hashtag, hashtag RACES, R-A-C-E-S, capital E-D-J, 2018. That's hashtag RACES, R-A-C-E-S, capital E-D-J, 2018. And of course, there's Wi-Fi, and if you haven't found it, um, we have them on the wall. The ID is Events Law. It's U of T is the, um, whatever you call that thing. Um, and ID is Events, I'm a techno person, you gotta bear with me. Uh, events Law, and the password is May, capital M, 2018. So, off to the beginning of our conference. This is our 10th year anniversary and our third conference on racial justice. And I love the title of this year's Racial Justice Leading the Change. This is an opportune time for those of us concerned with issues of social justice. We are in an election period. We go to the provincial um, e election in June 7th. In October, we have the municipal elections. And then again next year in October, I believe it is, we have the federal election. Lots of time to mobilize in our communities, to mobilize in our families, to talk about the issues that really matter. There are a number of campaigns happening for the June 7th provincial election. There's the Ontario For All campaign, which is a coalition of over 80 organizations. Color of Poverty, Color of Change. Um, we will be putting out our report card very soon. OCASI, the organization that pays my salary, um, also um, has a report card that will be coming out. We're waiting for the Liberals and the Conservatives to respond to our questions. The NDP has responded. The NDP has promised Ontario as a sanctuary province. Um, we are very excited about some of the initiatives that's on the table, and we need to push 
all three of the main parties and the Green Party as well, who's been paying attention to many of these issues, as we heard during a forum a couple of weeks ago, on where they stand on issues that matters to our communities, when they, where they stand on income security reform, where they stand on the anti-racism work that we've started here in the province, where they stand on the commitments that the province has made to dealing with issues of violence against women, where they stand on building an inclusive Ontario. So lots of conversations to be had with folks who show up at your door, but lots of conversation even more importantly with people you worship with with people you work with with people you play with and you love so looking forward to these kinds of conversations throughout the day as well but it is my great great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the morning AV go AV is no stranger to many of you AV go is the clinic director of the Chinese and Southeast Asian legal clinic and a founding st steering committee member of color poverty color change AV please come to the stage and help frame the day for us Thank you very much, and good morning to you all. Um, Debbie has uh, told us that you know you should never start the conference at nine o'clock. Nobody show up until nine thirty. We should have listened to her, <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay if you miss my presentation. Um, I'm just here to set the stage and provide some information about the color poverty color change, in case you have not heard about us. Okay. Oh, sorry. I accidentally started the video that was supposed to come after me. <laughs> um, and uh, for those who don't, uh, we, we started the campaign in 2007 uh, in response to at the time when the province was about to launch an anti well, poverty reduction strategy, and we just wanted to make sure that uh, it pays attention. It also pays attention to the racialization of poverty, and so color poverty since then have branched out to many other issues. Uh, we are an umbrella organization with mostly organizations uh, plus some individuals as well who share the goal of building a society that is uh, you know, equitable um, for all people. And in terms of our work, we have always adopted um, the mantra of leading with race uh, while injecting an intersectional approach to understanding racism and other forms of discrimination. And we push for changes uh, in a systemic way through policies and laws uh, in order to lift people up uh, uh, people of color, indigenous people, and ensure everyone in our society have an equal chance to succeed. And the work of our, uh, the Color Poverty Color Change is informed by shared concerns and priorities of communities of colors and indigenous peoples across the province. And we do that through uh, building communities, building, uh, uh, building um, relationships, uh, consultations, um, and in different parts of the province, particularly in cities like Windsor, Hamilton, uh, Thunder Bay, um, London, uh, and, and Peel region, and so on and so forth. And to achieve the goal of building a racially just and equitable society, we also try to make use of all available political and legal platforms, be it local, provincial, national, or international, which you'll hear about later uh, this morning as well. And apart from um, pushing the government uh, to change, we also try to push sometimes our own you know, sort of partners, our allies, and other public institutions as well. And you know, including, you know, in, my, in my case, it's Legal Aid Ontario who funds uh, Legal Clinic. But of course, our work is not without challenge. There's always a lot of resistance among you know, the broader public as well as uh, within the government and uh, some of the institutions to talk about race, let alone acknowledging that there is racism in our society. But we just, you know, we just, we are very persistent and we, and of course we also get a lot of support from our friends and allies. And as a result of that, I have to say that we have made uh, some gains and you will hear about some of those gains uh, at, you know, this morning panel. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of those examples right now. For instance, at the provincial level, um, we were able to get the provincial government to adopt anti-racism legislation and to create an anti-racism directorate, which will uh, collect the segregated race-based data from various government ministries. Uh, they are starting with um, uh, criminal justice, child welfare, education, and hopefully they will expand to other ministries as well. And our efforts have even led to uh, Legal Aid Ontario uh, to start collecting race-based data uh, among the clients uh, who use Legal Aid. 
And some of the institutions who have long been supportive of the color poverty uh, initiatives, such as United Way Peel, uh, they started um, requiring their funded agencies to also collect uh, race-based and other demographic, demographic data on a disaggregated basis. And uh, of course, we are, you know, we are really pushing for the collection of disaggregated data. And of course, when we first started, you know, 10 years ago, like, you know, when we talk about disaggregated data, it was like, how do you spell that? But I think today it's like everybody is saying, yeah, we need disaggregated data. Like I recently was at this, you know, W7 event. Like, you know, I guess some of you may know that Canada is hosting G7. And I guess there's like a W7, which started by um, the German chancellor when she hosted uh, G7 a few years ago. The idea is to bring together feminists to talk about what the G7 country should do. And so Shalini and I and Debbie were at this event, and it just so happened, like, you know, we were sitting at different table, and um, uh, Trudeau also has their, has his own gender equality advisory council, whatever they call it. Uh, and um, Mel, um, what's his name? Bill Gates' wife. Melinda Gates, yes. Melinda Gates is a co-chair. Co and she was sitting at my table during lunchtime and even she was talking about disaggregated data. So we are going somewhere. <laughs> but, um, but still, there are a lot of uh, challenges still and, you know, and who knows, on June 8th, um, whether we'll be talking about, you know, sort of branching out and, you know, pushing for more changes, or we'll be talking about how to sustain the very modest gains that we have made, right? So hopefully later on today in the afternoon session, we'll have a chance to talk about that. And one of the workshops is also about the uh, election strategy. So let's, let's keep that in mind uh, between now and June 7th, and of course the October uh, uh, provincial, uh, municipal elections is also just as important. And uh, ultimately our leaders are still very reluctant to talk about race and tackle racism, and which is why we need to continue to work together. And we all know what we want, and the question is just the how, right? So, Today is about how, like today is not about, you know, regurgitating one of the issues that we face, but, you know, sort of, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, but I hope that all of you will focus on the how, um, whether it's around employment equity or it's around poverty reduction, whatever issues that you're working on, how can we work together collectively to not only sustain the gain, but more importantly, to lead to more, even more positive changes for the communities that we work for. So with that, I want to uh, just introduce um, you know, to you uh, a video that we have put uh, together uh, to give you a bit more background about color poverty, uh, color change, and what our hope is for the next uh, five years. And Shalini is going to help me with that. <coughs> The Color Poverty campaign started as a result of a book written by Grace Edward Galabuzzi, who is a professor at Ryerson University. And he wrote a, a book called Canada's Economic Apartheid. The book was groundbreaking in the sense that, although I'm sure a lot of people knew anecdotally at the time that racialized communities were facing struggles, the book was the first in Canada which really put it all down on paper. Um, using statistical analysis, as well as, of course, uh, very well-researched uh, um, scholarly analysis as well to highlight how divided Canada is along the racial line. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, the province and it was in the middle of an election and um, folks were beginning to talk about poverty reduction. Uh, specifically, the Liberal Party were making noises and commitments about implementing some sort of anti-poverty strategy. For many of us working in community, we became concerned that there was an absent 
um, of discussions about racialized communities in particular, um, who we know are overrepresented in poverty numbers. And there was a real need uh, for the group of people who eventually formed Color of Poverty, Color of Change, to talk about um, when you're addressing issues of poverty that you have to really look at the different identities of people falling into poverty and one of those identities being their ethno-racial background as some of the drivers and indicators of why that's happening. Well, in the early days, it was mostly trying to find the right spaces to make those statements and, and be able to be present in spaces where our voices were absent. Us coming together from very different ethnic, uh, ethno-racial diversity groups uh, as a collective group, we're able to push back and, and find those spaces and access those spaces. But it was a grassroots campaign. It was uh, basically an organic initiatives from different groups uh, that understand the effect on poverty amongst their communities. Um, I remember uh, sitting in meetings and having a conversation about what this group will be called and one of our colleagues who is no longer here in Canada um, came up with the name Color of Poverty and that certainly um, struck a chord with many of us around the table. And here we are a decade later and Color of Poverty, Color of Change has been making its mark ever since. Je pense qu'un des, des défis qu'on a eu est peut-être une des choses euh, pour laquelle on peut euh, se permettre de se fé féliciter comme couleur de pauvreté, c'est la collection de ce qu'on appelle les, 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 les data désagrégés. Euh, parce que jusqu'à pour l'instant, la majorité des gouvernements, la majorité des, des ministères refusaient de faire la collection de ces data désagrégés. Et sans avoir donc ces data qui identifient particulièrement certains groupes euh, de par leur groupe ethnique, leurs origines ou leur race, on ne peut pas se permettre de développer des politiques intelligentes pour adresser la question de la pauvreté. Color of Poverty is probably one of the first organizations that put together information, we call them fact sheets, on um, the indicators of the impact of um, being racialized in different areas, so on poverty, on health, on education, and on justice. And the reality is those fact sheets have been relied on not only by our campaign, but by people across the country, politicians, activists, to really start understanding the issues. It started, you know, I think really as a labor of love for the people who worked at Color Poverty, but the reality is it's cr created a really fundamental base of information that continues to get updated and created a way of thinking right around how do these things all connect and we talk about that word intersection now really easily like people have started to have a better understanding of it but those fact sheets were about intersection at a time when those discussions weren't happening in Canada and now we we see that we see it we see governments talking about it. We see schools talking about it. We see police talking about it. I really do think Color of Poverty played a critical role in raising that conversation and continuing to push for the collection of disaggregated data in many different sectors that impact people's lives. I think uh, the Color of Poverty has played a huge role in getting good information out. I know from a personal standpoint, um, when I needed uh, good data and information, I would call some of my um, contacts at the Color of Poverty to get that information. In regards to the Anti-Racism Directorate, we're fortunate enough as a government to have great people on our advisory committee. I think to get to the place where we are today where people associate good data and policy decision with along, uh, you know, racial lines, you know, we've gone so far, so it's great to have advocates like the Color of Poverty. So these fact sheets became a, a learning uh, tool, a tool that we were using to educate people, not just uh, the mainstream institutions and the government, but also to engage our own diverse populations in the conversation about race and uh, poverty. And today we are, we are much better off in terms of having the tools to talk about these issues, having the recognition that uh, poverty is not r a result of uh, immigration, which often is cited as the thing because racialization is, is the more important factor that needs to be mentioned and, and discussed and, and addressed. Um, je pense que l'initiative de la couleur de la pauvreté dans les prochaines années, dans les prochains mois, va éventuellement essayer de répondre à, encore à certains défis. Celui de l'équité d'emploi, par exemple, qui demeure un problème important. Je crois qu'une loi sur l'équité d'emploi est nécessaire surtout à l'échelle des gouvernements, des agences gouvernementales, pour essayer de remédier 
à, à cette discrimination qui existe sur le marché du travail. Il y a beaucoup d'individus qui ne sont pas malheureusement euh, acceptés dans le milieu du travail parce qu'ils n'ont pas les collections nécessaires ou parce qu'ils sont vus comme euh, autres personnes qui portent le hijab, par exemple. While there is an opening to collect and segregate the data in such areas as uh, education, criminal justice, child welfare, they haven't really moved beyond that. Uh, particularly, um, they haven't moved into collecting data in the labor market. And we need that data because we know that um, inequality in the labor market is the root cause for many other things, right? Without access to good jobs, uh, we cannot earn good money, right? Um, the discrimination in the labor market therefore leads to income inequality, which in turn leads to poverty being racialized. Uh, it also leads to poorer health outcome for racialized groups. Uh, unequal access to housing and so on. For me, that's one of the real blessings of being part of the campaign. The work is really symbiotic with what we see in terms of our grassroots work with clients. And in the same way, we are able to bring back to the campaign what we see in our grassroots work and what we think needs to happen systemically. Um, I think, you know, we're not where we want to be. I think we would admit that right but that um, the color of poverty is almost a direct amplifier of what the reality is on the ground for our clients and uh, amplifies it in spaces that our clients may not have the capacity to be in i think the city of toronto often prides itself for the diversity it has as a, as a city um, and i think uh, we are at a point where many of us are tired just talking about diversity as a strength and not necessarily dealing with some of the underlying root causes of racism and anti-black racism, Islamophobia, uh, within uh, the structures that we have. Um, so I, you know, I, I, think, I think we have to move away now from just talking about celebrating diversity to kind of looking at an anti-oppressive, anti-racist framework for the government that we have. Uh, that needs to happen in collaboration with city councillors like me who advocate for that as well as organizations and coalitions like the Color of Body, Color of Change working together. I think one of our biggest issue is funding um, and sustainable funding for the work that we want to do. We need the resources to be able to, to do it, um, but I'm hopeful. I think that we have great credibility um, as a coalition and more and more, as more and more folks join, as we um, gain traction in more and more parts of Ontario and hopefully across the country that we will begin to see some of our initiatives being adopted and pushed through. Key to uh, the coalition building is to recognize the different place that Indigenous people stand in relation to the Canadian state. And we need to acknowledge the legacy of colonization on the Indigenous people. Um, I think uh, the, the most uh, involved I was with the color of poverty was when a gathering was uh, put on where we brought uh, members from different communities together to talk about the importance of reconciliation uh, and how important it was that uh, we work together uh, in a collaborative way to further reconciliation in Canada for uh, all Canadians. And so uh, it was a, a two-day event and the commissioners from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission attended uh, as well as a number of staff and some of our survivors from Indian Residential School. Um, and it was an opportunity for different uh, uh, communities to speak about reconciliation, about their role in reconciliation, uh, and to really acknowledge shared oppression uh, and shared uh, uh, experiences with racism. What was really exciting about the event was that everyone came forward and jointly committed to reconciliation and issued a statement of reconciliation. And um, I think Color of Poverty and Color of Change have uh, lived up to their commitments that they've made and continues to live up to those commitments. And having shared oppression and having shared experiences with racism in Canada uh, actually brings communities together. And bringing people together 
learning about each other uh, removes those barriers that we have. So uh, Justice Sinclair always said that reconciliation is uh, about um, changing the way we speak to each other and changing the way that we talk about each other. And so I think uh, organizations like Color of um, Poverty bring different communities together to learn about each other and to support each other in the work that needs to be done in Canada. The truth is socioeconomic security for people is fundamental. Color of Poverty has really broadened its agenda, right? To really think about what are the things that are really impacting people, health outcomes, education outcomes, criminal justice outcomes, and in particular, income outcomes. So not just looking at poverty reduction, but really even the larger picture around income maintenance. And I think moving forward, that's a focus that we are hoping to have and that, you know, all the people in our network and our campaign will hopefully agree is a priority, right, for the people that we work with. I'm also hoping that we will continue to grow nationally, right, and to be able to create as broad a network as we can um, around, you know, the impact for all Canadians. Le modèle de la couleur de la pauvreté comme une initiative uh, grassroots, comme on dit en anglais, une initiative communautaire, communautariste, peut être, à mon avis, copiée ailleurs. Je sais qu'on a des intérêts de groupes du Québec qui sont intéressés par ce qu'on a fait. Quand on a commencé, c'était un, un processus ou une initiative au niveau du Grand Toronto. Maintenant, on a des partenariats partout euh, en Ontario. Donc, donc, je crois que ce genre d'initiative de campagne euh, qui est développée à l'échelle communautaire est peut-être quelque chose d'intéressant à suivre. Et je crois que le modèle pourrait fonctionner à l'échelle du Canada. Being involved with Color of Party Coalition and being involved with the fellow activists on that empowered me inspired me. You know, each of those individuals have a story to tell, they have a lot of passion, they have lots of knowledge. So every day in those meetings when we met, every one of those meetings were places where I learned, where I got inspired by my fellow activists. At the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We all want justice. We all want equality. We all want the equal opportunity to succeed and the opportunity to live a meaningful life. And to do that, we must all work together and the best way to do so is to work in coalition in order to support each other's cause. Thank you. Ten years of our work. Congratulations, Color of Poverty, Color of Change. We're going to have to tell Michael he, he really needs to, he owes us that we give him such a huge plug in the middle of an election campaign. <laughs> Notice I didn't use the last name. Um, let me, we're getting ready for our panel. Well, panelists, will you join me on stage, please, while I introduce to you our moderator for this morning's panel, Mohamed Bujinian. Bujinian is the former president of the Canadian Arab Federation. Uh, he is a Moroccan-born journalist and social democratic politician who lives in, in Etobicoke, Ontario. I love when people from Toronto name their specific village. Um, he, sir, uh, he joined the Franco-Ontario television station in 1995 and served as a reporter there for 10 years. He switched careers in 2005 and served as the executive director of the Canadian Arab Federation until 2009. Over the years, he has been part of many human rights organizations and boards, and since 2010, he has been a civil servant of the Ontario provincial government. Mohammed's work in the area of anti-racism, civil liberties, and human rights has included memberships on the Toronto Chief of Police's Advisory Council and the executive of the National Anti-Racism Canadian Coalition. He has made public presentation to the Arar Public Inquiry and to federal parliamentary committees examining Bill C-36, the anti-terrorism -terror legislation. You can read the rest of his bio in your package. Please welcome Mohammed and our panel for this morning. Thank you and uh, welcome all. I'm very happy to be mm -hmm. here this morning to uh, direct the traffic. Uh, we have a very impressive uh, panelist and I hope you will enjoy uh, the panel this morning. Uh, just to maybe uh, put the table, this panel will give us a bit of an idea 
of the lay of the land, if I can say that. Uh, the uh, Canadian government, uh, of course, is a, a signatory of international convention, uh, had to obviously obey the international law, human rights, international law, and so on and so forth. The uh, Ontario government also put uh, forward some policy initiatives, like the uh, uh, Anti-Racism Directorate. The City of Toronto also is involved in some of initiatives directing to fight uh, racism. So we, we will try to understand what exists out there, what type of policy program initiatives uh, we can look at, and what are success we achieve. As uh, uh, Avi said, we, we do indeed uh, congregate ourselves after 10 years. The Color of Poverty was able to push forward some of the agenda, either is social housing or uh, income equality, uh, justice system, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, with our panelists, we'll try to, to understand what's out there and what we can uh, do to move forward. So uh, I'm gonna introduce them, uh, not necessarily in the order what they speak, but more in the order where uh, they're sitting. Uh, Sandra Carnegie Douglas, uh, she is the anti-racism and cultural diversity officer at the University of Toronto. Sandra, it's right at my uh, left. Prior to assuming her role as the anti-racism and cultural diversity officer with the university, Sandra held previous position as diversity manager with the Toronto Public Library and a director of programming and special project with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. Sandra has certainly a considerable experience working in the area of human rights, anti-racism and social justice in both the public sector and community-based organization. Her interests at work have primarily focused on organization and social change. Her work also taking her into the international area, uh, arena, and we will hear from her, where she participated as an NGO delegate at several meetings of the United Nations Commission of the Status of Women, the United Nations Commission of Human Rights, and the United Nations Third World Conference Against Racism. Then uh, sitting uh, beside Sandra is Mohammed Rashidi. Mohammed Rashidi is uh, a former uh, member of the Canadian Arab Federation. He's the spokesperson and also uh, uh, a legal advisor to the Canadian Arab Federation. Mohammed is fluent in French, English, and Arabic with vast experience in the field of advocacy since 2001. He began working as a legal representative starting in 2004, conducting trial and appeals related to motor vehicle accident, real estate, small claim court, and criminal court. Mohammed worked in different level of the justice system at civil litigation, personal injury, criminal law, real estate, and community advocacy. Mohammed studied at, uh, studied at University of Toronto, University of Manitoba and the United States. Uh, Mohammed is a member of the advisory uh, group uh, sitting on Islamophobia uh, with the Anti-Racism Directorate. And Mohammed was also uh, featured as a regular panelist on CBC's Power and Politics. Beside Mohammed is Shalini. Let me just grab her. Shalini Konalor is the executive director of the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario and one of the most active and dynamic members of the Color of Poverty campaign. Shalini is a lawyer and the executive director of the clinic. Uh, Salko is a, a co-founder of the steering committee, as I said, of the Color of Poverty. And through Salko, the COP, Shalini has worked on issue of racial justice and race equity for the past several years, systematic racism in immigration, racialized poverty, and employment equity. Shalini, apparently new as Venture, is learning how to ice skate. So, good luck. <laughs> Haven't broken anything yet. <laughs> Beside uh, Shalini, Notisha Masakoi. Notisha is the executive director for Women's Health in Women's Hand Community Health Center. Notisha is currently the uh, executive director in that organization. It's the only community health center in North America which provides specialized primary health care for racialized women. She is also a lecturer at the Faculty of Social Work at Ryerson. Her research and publication have focused on increased access to primary health care for racialized women and the impact of systematic racism on the health outcome of black women in Canada. She is the co-editor of, of the anthology to rising empowerment, Canadian perspective on black feminism thought. And finally, and not the least, Larissa Crawford. 
Larissa is a graduating undergrad student from York University in international development and communication. Actually, she's going to graduate this June 2018. Congratulations. <laughs> Larissa is both an anti-racism policy uh, activist and indigenous researcher. She initiated, for example, a research project at York University uh, on race-based data collection. She works on ind indigenous decolonization and research project, and she served as the head delegate of Canada Y7 delegation, a former G7 youth advisory body, where she integrated indigenous voice into international policies, and she's a public speaker who provides a free speech and workshop across Canada to underprivileged youth, and she's a proud mother to one-year-old daughter. Welcome. <laughs> So as I said, I will ask the panelists to speak maybe five minutes to, to six minutes max each to tell us a little bit about uh, one of the area of expertise or area they, they, they work on. And we, we should start with the first conference on anti-racism in Durban. In 2001, the international community under the United Nations and the former president of South Africa, um, Nelson Mandela, uh, w gather in Durban in South Africa to develop a, a, a framework and policies to address the issue of racism, intolerance, indigenous issue, gender inequality, and so on and so forth. Uh, so Sandra Carnegie Hall was part of uh, the NGO delegation that participated at Durban in 2001, and she was just 15 at the time, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, she, will, she will let us and, and, and give us, uh, because the Durban was uh, somehow a trigger for the international community to uh, basically develop uh, initiatives, policies to address specifically the issue of racism, decolonization, reparation for slavery, and indigenous rights. And Canada was also signatory of that uh, famous declaration. I think 74 countries signed that declaration except two for different reasons. And uh, that also pushed Canada to develop its third action plan on racism. So Sandra Carnegie. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. When I saw that Mohammed would be moderating, I really seriously considered withdrawing. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me why I wanted to. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, I was actually asked to speak about uh, KPAR, the C uh, Canadian Action Plan Against Racism. Um, and so what I'll say briefly about the World Conference Against Racism was that it was one of those spaces where, um, for the first time, it was the first World Conference that I had ever attended, um, but also participating in the lead up to the conference. But what it uh, represented in terms of the broad representation of peoples from around the world, and especially NGOs, and to see activists, academics, um, government representatives, and the wide spectrum of uh, civil society engaging with governments about this issue of racism and racial discrimination, <clears throat> especially given that it, these are issues that are not easily taken up, addressed, and or named in our societies, including here in Canada. So what that meant in terms of uh, being a major incentive and catalyst uh, for peoples on the ground uh, to, mobilize, uh, sorry, to mobilize around this issue was huge. And, and that mobilization was also significant right here in Canada. Um, leading up to the conference itself, um, NGOs were participating in a lot of the preparatory conferences um, leading up to the actual world conference. And that was really important because what that allowed is for the opportunities for, um, for NGOs, so people on the ground, to actually inform and shape the agenda uh, for the world conference. And so taking up uh, these issues of racism and racial discrimination and, um, and all of the, the, the related areas in ways and in terms of dimensions that are not usually talked about within our country. So thinking about redress, thinking about the specificities of uh, distinct groups and their experiences of racism and what that looks like, going beyond this um, broad generalized um, understanding of racism and where the assumption often is that we all experience racism in the same way. Um, in, at the World Conference, that was a key space in which 
that kind of um, understanding and conceptualization was actually um, pulled apart, broken down, and more in-depth analysis uh, where NGOs um, and as well governments were also, some governments were calling for the need to look at the distinct realities and experiences of different groups and to name that and to, to also make the connection between uh, people's experiences of marginalization and exclusion uh, to the historical um, aspect and experiences and, and that uh, there is importance, there is significance, and there is, you know, um, a need to make that con connection because history still continue to inform our lives even to today, and that these issues and experiences of racism and marginalization aren't just contemporary experiences, they're very much connected to the history. So hence, you know, the conversations about um, enslavement, colonization, um, you know, imperialism and how that has impacted so many peoples around the world, making that connection to, to today. So that was another key piece. Um, another key um, achievement coming out of the conference was the push uh, to collect disaggregated data. And some of that work and lobbying also began um, within the, um, the women's conference. So Beijing actually was one of the places, I, I, I'm not in a space where I can say that was where it was initiated for the first time, but I can definitely say those conversations were already uh, being taken up within the space uh, around women's rights, women's uh, equality rights. And so that conversation about the need for states to collect disaggregated data uh, was also another area that was front and center for NGOs and pushing strongly for that. So if you were to look at the Durban uh, Program for Action, you'll see some of those uh, types of uh, distinctions and specificities uh, named within the, the program itself. So that became a tool uh, for us here in Canada to continue to push for change. Um, and so um, in talking about the Canada Action Plan Against Racism, that plan was actually launched in uh, 2005. It was a five-year plan. And the catalyst for that was, in many ways, um, the World Conference uh, Against Racism, so the lead up to that, because in preparation for Canada's participation, there were a number of uh, domestic consultations across the country in 2000 and 2001. Um, I participated in many of them, and there are some people in here that I'm looking at and seeing, and then, so there are others here in the audience, about, including some at the table here, um, who participated in that. And what was really striking about that whole participation was just to see the mobilization and how much the country was galvanized around this issue of racism and race. You know, so you know, once and for all, race was center stage, and there was no pushing back, and um, NGOs were feeling really uh, supported um, in bringing the conversations forward but also still pushing within those spaces to take up some of those very difficult conversations that oftentimes government didn't want to hear. Um, we weren't settling for you know, concepts of diversity. We were also pushing back against equity in the sense of this is not about watering down, this is not about refusing to name, this is about naming racism, making it front and center, um, and so that uh, both governments and civil society uh, do pay attention and, and see this as a priority. So those conversations help to inform uh, the development of the uh, Canada Action Plan Against Racism and then the results coming out of uh, the World Conference Against Ra uh, Racism as well Canada's own involvement around many of the international c uh, commitments that Mohammed mentioned earlier so third um, even within the, uh, the Beijing Platform for Action, bringing some of those um, priorities and commitments and reflecting that within the um, within um, KPAR, as we, as we call it. Um, so it was initially intended to be Canada's, the government of Canada's agenda to combat racism, and, but it ultimately was designed to coordinate performance and measurements among the funded initiatives that um, that were addressed under the plan. 
And as I mentioned before, the catalyst for the plan being the response to the international events of the World Conference, the domestic consultations, and as well when the UN um, Special Rapporteur for Racism and Racial Discrimination came to Canada, he also prepared a report and in that report did call on governments to uh, to develop an action plan to combat racism. So those were some of the, the, the reasons uh, for Canada to step up and to decide uh, once and for all to uh, develop a plan um, to combat racism. The, it's a five year, it was a five year plan. Its goal was to ensure that all Canadians were included and had a role in society and the economy, regardless of background, race, or ethnicity. And the other goal was that, that all barriers to full and active participation and opportunity were eliminated, and that the justice system was equipped to respond to overt manifestations of racism in society, right? So those are some of the goals. Um, so the plan was organized around six key priorities, assist victims and groups vulnerable to racism and related forms of discrimination, develop forward-looking approaches to promote diversity and combat racism, strengthen the role of civil society, strengthen regional and international cooperation, educate children and youth on diversity and anti-racism, and counter hate and bias. Um, that plan included more than 40 initiatives and strategies that were part of existing budgets and programs in more than 20 departments and agencies. $53.6 million um, in funding was allocated to nine new initiatives within four departments, uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage, uh, CIC, which is Citizenship and Immigration Canada, Human Resources and Skill Development Canada, which is probably renamed now, and the Department of Justice. And it was led by the Multiculturalism branch uh, Department of Canadian Heritage, which was then subsequently moved over to Citizenship and Multiculturalism branch in uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada. So what did this plan achieve? Um, so the, um, in uh, 2010, the then government so, um, um, commissioned the government consulting services to do an evaluation of the plan and to look at what the plan um, achieved in its five years. Highlights from the findings are that um, the prevalence of racism in Canada continues, surprise, surprise. The rationale for initiatives to combat racism and discrimination has not changed uh, since uh, KPAR began, and that KPAR is aligned with federal legislative responsibilities. And it is also aligned with Canada's international commitments. It appears that uh, KPAR has been the most successful in its funded uh, activities related to increasing knowledge of hate crimes. That is, the nationally standardized data collection strategy on hate-motivated crime was frequently identified as one of the key successes of the plan. And a key part of that was the, um, the, the, the training uh, that was provided uh, to police officers across the country. Um, and on uh, collecting and reporting on uh, hate crimes. The other findings um, from that um, evaluation are that um, during, during its implementation, one of the expectation was that there would be frequent consultation with stakeholders about the progress that, that was being made under KPAR. Um, limited consultation took place and did not focus on the progress, even though the original action plan stated that the lead department would consult with stakeholders. In terms of its performance, the nature and scope of the plan made it difficult to assess its overall impact on combating racism. Performance was affected by the fact that not all initiatives were implemented as intended, and four of the original nine funded initiatives did not go forward as originally planned. So I talk about this in the sense of, if we're talking about fighting racism and combating racism and the role of our governments in this, you know, it really s it speaks volume in terms of what we need to do um, as civil society in pushing our governments. And when they're talking about combating racism, what exactly are they planning to do? How are they being held accountable? And given 2005 to now, what is it we can show in terms of the progress that we've made significantly to address in particular and eliminate structural and systemic racism? Maybe this is a good segue to the yeah. next speaker. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe uh, ask Shalini to give us 
exactly, I mean, what the NGO can do to influence the process. And there's a process called CERD, where the Canadian government have to go to the UN and present its strategy and its plan and say, this is what we did to address racism or discrimination in our country. And NGOs have the opportunity also to put forward their own plan or their own report to influence that. And I know, Shalini, you were part of the Color of Poverty and other NGOs delegation that present that. Can you talk to us about that? Absolutely. Um, so I was asked to speak today about um, the international pressure that can be placed on Canada to um, address issues of systemic racism, racism in general. And um, yes. last night in our panel, Bev Jacobs uh, left us with one of her learnings, which was um, that we shouldn't be afraid to speak and that we have an obligation to say what needs to be said. And what needs to be said is that Canada has had a big fat fail on addressing race equity, racial justice issues. Um, a lot of conversation has been had by all the, those of us who do the international work on whether the United Nations has any value or efficacy. Does it work? Is it too pie in the sky? Because it does take our resources to make submissions and to go and to speak. So I'll tell you two things. The first thing is that it allowed us, the third opportunity in particular, which I'll talk about, allowed us to push back against Canada's international reputation as this most excellent um, exa shining example of equity. Uh, we gave presentations on different aspects of systemic racism, and the first question that we got stumped us. The first question from the committee was, you're saying all of this to us, can you explain to us how Canada is such a tremendous propaganda machine? Uh, and we got stumped. And that's when I realized we have an obligation to use these mechanisms to push our agenda domestically, but we also have an obligation to have the world understand that we are not that shining example of equity. I think for where we are now, there's a lot of discussion around equity, but a colleague that I had a conversation in the hall with this morning noted for me, and it's true, that when we talk about equity, all we're talking about today in Canada is gender equity, right? We are not talking about race equity. And um, A.V. had mentioned in her opening speech that we had the privilege and the opportunity to sit with the G7 in the W7. And our own prime minister, I, we got to ask him a question, talked so eloquently about intersectionality and understanding it. And so then the question arises, well, if you get it, why aren't you doing anything about it, right? And that Canada Action Plan Against Racism really hasn't brought us to where we should be at this point. So my view is that the international use of mechanisms like the United Nations do two things. They help us to paint a real picture of what's happening in Canada to bring international pressure on Canada. And they also help us to actually push forward the domestic agenda. And so the process itself is fairly simple. You uh, can go onto Google, as I did, and this was my first experience doing United Nations work. Um, it will give you timelines for when to do a shadow report or a submission. Hopefully, you will think about doing that in coalition with a large number of groups so that you have less work to do. You'll submit it, and then you'll make an application to speak at the UN. To be frank, I actually thought that these were completely inaccessible opportunities to somebody like me working at a legal clinic in Ontario. They are not. Um, we put in an application. We were allowed to come. Of course, we had to fund it on our own, but we were allowed to come and speak to the committee. And they were very interested in hearing what we had to say. And um, I think the reality is Almost everyone in this room will have expertise on pieces of the information that that committee wants to know. We are there to educate them. We are there to help them craft recommendations for Canada. We are there to put that pressure on. So that is a really important piece. And what we can see from CERD was we pushed an agenda of a few things. We pushed, obviously, for the collection of disaggregated data. We pushed for the um, revitalization and strengthening of a significant national action plan against racism with 
fiscal resources attached to it embedded in legislation. We pushed for immigration reform to deal with a number of systemic racism pieces in immigration, like immigration detention, like the safe third country rule, like the way refugees are currently treated in Canada, like um, the way our family sponsorship process really favors white people, let's just say it. <laughs> um, and so what we saw then was interest from different members in all of those issues. And what we were able to do was give them the actual things that we wanted to see in the report. And when we got the report back, those items were there. So then the question becomes, does that mean anything? OK, it's just another United Nations report. Uh, our stuff is in there. Great. Did anything happen? A few things have happened. So we've had, at the federal level, a commitment in the budget to start consultations on a national action plan against racism. That's not to say that just what we did at CERD is the reason that happened, but it played a role. Can the Canadian government had to sit and listen to what we say, and we're in a time where hopefully they may listen. We also saw movement on immigration detention. We've seen discussion around looking at the best interests of children, thinking about why we even detain children at all in immigration detention, thinking about why do we put people in provincial jails instead of in detention centers, and really getting rid of detention centers altogether. So we have seen movement. Um, it will not always be that way. There's an element of politics in doing the international work and the idea of whether you're in a climate where somebody would listen. I suspect maybe 10 years ago we would not have been in that climate. But we are. And the other piece that really flowed from it was having engaged in that international work allowed us then to have connection to what's happening domestically. And in December of this year, after 29 years, Canada reconvened its federal provincial table on human rights. And that was pressure from all of the bodies doing international work across the country to say, let's start talking. And we have to be frank in that we can make international recommendations for the federal government, but in this country, we need the provinces at the table too. Because a lot of the work really is at the provincial level. And so the pieces of pushing and becoming stronger in those areas was really critical. What was really... Um, troubling for me was that, um, and, what, and what was good at the same time, was that um, I think in the past there have been a lot of voices missing from those international conversations around racism in Canada. Um, I know our counterparts at the African Canadian Legal Clinic had done strong work throughout the years on anti-black racism. And I know our brothers and sisters from indigenous communities continue to push back on that front. Where we hadn't seen a lot of representation outside of that were all the other peoples of color in Canada who still are not probably engaged at that level. And so it was an opportunity to work in solidarity, support the work of our indigenous brothers and sisters, support the work on anti-black racism, and also add to it the experiences of growing populations of other peoples of color in Canada, which I think Canada has largely ignored. Um, and some of our issues are the same, and some are not, right? And so all of it has to be heard. So it was a really um, interesting experience. The other opportunity we had was then to listen to how Canada portrays itself. And I'll leave you with an anecdote that sticks with me. So we get to sit at the CERD committee and listen to Canada give its presentation. And they said in their presentation, Canada is doing well. We do not, our police forces do not racially profile. That is the literal reaction that we had at CERD. But it helps you in the sense that you get a better understanding of where our government counterparts are at and what we need to push. Because that is a, that is a ridiculous statement to have made. It was actually not necessary to make that statement. And it, it shows the frustration of how much work we need to do and continue to do. But I think... Um, that international piece sometimes feels for us sort of out of reach and, and daunting. It really isn't. That's the, the message I want to leave you with. Um, and, and it sounds cliche, but really, if I can do it, I think almost anybody can do it. Um, my son actually thinks he probably could have done it better than me. He's nine. <laughs> and so um, 
I think it's a mechanism to do two things. Push the domestic agenda. We have to remobilize. As Sandra said, we are, I think, have lost a maybe because we have been so tired and beaten back by all that's coming at us. We've lost that mobilization. This is a piece that can do that. And we also have to push on the international stage so people understand. I think pressure and having Canada shown in its true light will have an impact. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. I, I think it's important just to, uh, and, and, and I think Sandra and Shalini uh, clearly said it, government don't like to be shame in front of the international community. They hate that. And quite frankly, the only space where sometimes the indigenous community of Canada had their right protected we're going in front of those international spheres and international uh, organization because the court in Canada ignore them and the government ignore them. So it's important for the anti-racism agenda to also use those international mechanisms to put forward its, 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 its uh, objectives. And uh, Sandra uh, uh, Shalini also said the work also needs to be done at the provincial level. It's very crucial, it's important. Uh, in the 90s, the uh, former NDP government created the um, anti-racism secretariat. Uh, and that uh, organization was supposed to put forward policies after the uh, famous uh, Lewis report, after riots in the city of Toronto, if you remember. Uh, but that uh, organization and that secretariat was the first thing the Mike Harris government eliminate. Uh, and since then, we push for the same body or same organization to be able to address the issue of racism at the provincial level. And finally, two years ago, and I have to say the color of poverty did a lot of work to push for that. The Ontario government created the anti-racism uh, directorate. And Mohammed Rashidi is a, a member of uh, an advisory uh, working group on Islamophobia. And we want you, Mohammed, to tell us a little bit about the work the anti-racism directorate is doing and what they're planning to do uh, ahead uh, to address the issue of Islamophobia and other forms of intolerance. Uh, bonjour, good morning. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I, I will be speaking about the anti-racism directorate. I'm curious, if, who has heard of it in this room? Okay, so, that, so, so that's pretty good. So, um, I, I'm glad to see that because I think had, had there not been a lot of hands up, I think it would be a, a failure even at this early stage. The, the anti-racism directorate was in fact a, a, an initiative, and, and as uh, uh, Monsieur Boujnan had just said, the color of poverty and Boujnan himself played some roles behind the scenes to try and, and bring this about. Um, I recall s several political parties were really used to put pressure on the Liberal Party to, to bring this forward. I think the initiative is a, is a noble one. It's a, an attempt to make changes from within, and uh, it's very new. I'll run through the dates of when all of this happened. And the reason I emphasize that it's new is because I think it's fragile and susceptible to pressure. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on uh, who does the pressure, of course. Um, by 2036, it's estimated that racialized people will account for roughly half of Ontario's population. Uh, at the same time, Ontario is home to the largest and fastest growing population of, of indigenous people uh, in the country. So it goes without saying that uh, the path that we are on of inequality is only going to exacerbate uh, problems in our society given the direction that the population uh, is going. So a space, uh, and, and this was sort of the initiative for the directorate, is that to create a space where community organizations shareholders and government ministries can collaborate and shape policy together. And this brought about a three-year plan uh, to, for anti-racism uh, strategic planning. So you can ask a lot of questions and, I, and really more than anything I, I would be looking forward to, to taking questions. I'll, I'll touch on what the directorate has done and, and its goals. Uh, but I think there are more questions than answers uh, at this stage. So 
In 2016, the Anti-Racism Directorate held about 10 uh, public community meetings across the province on systemic racism. Perhaps some of you uh, attended uh, one or more. I did, and I, I found it to be uh, I found it to be constructive. I found it to be very engaging. The rooms were packed. There was a lot of aggressive and heated exchanges, and I thought that a lot of government officials, who oftentimes may be uh, out of touch with with the feelings of people who suffer on a daily basis, I got a little bit of a taste of of what it's like, or at least the feelings of those who experience racism on a daily basis. Uh, the numbers of people who attended are uh, somewhere around 4,500 people, uh, people who attended those meetings, and the strategic plan was launched uh, on March the 7th of 2017. The focus and the strategic plan focus was on policy, research, and evaluation, sustainability and accountability, public education and awareness, community collaboration, population-specific anti-racism initiatives. And so you get an idea of what was uh, the direction or what were the key points uh, that this initiative was trying to tackle. In May 2017, uh, consultation groups were uh, were created they're anti-racism consultation groups and they were called subcommittees and, and we now have four of them there is an anti-black racism there is an anti-semitism Islamophobia and anti-indigenous racism okay so those are the four and it and really that's as, that's as far as, as the committee or as the directorate could really uh, get, in my opinion, in terms of a, of a long-term achievement or a lasting achievement. There was always this fact that elections were coming up and uh, the province is looking uh, for potential change. So there was always an elephant in the room in so far as achieving something long-term. Um, and a lot of discussions took place and as I said this is an attempt to make changes from within and I got to see a lot of uh, you know the activists who put in the hard work and, and give their input about whether we want to create a body of information that can educate the public or we want to create changes in so far as how policy is implemented um, so, for example, uh, there are a lot of studies on racism. There are a lot of studies on how it impacts people. The, the average Ontarian, uh, the average Canadian probably, uh, unless they themselves are racialized, probably don't have much experience with this. And we even saw with the pushback at the initial attempts to creating these directorate, this directorate that a lot of people don't see a, a need for it. And obviously, frontline people such as ourselves um, understand that pushback um, and so that's one of the initial uh, obstacles that that we faced and that I think everybody faces in this field that why do we need something like this is racism that big of a deal and so education is a big uh, is a big part of what the director is trying to do and some members some individuals involved uh, believe in that uh, the counterpoint to that and, and I'm sure everybody here has their opinion. The counterpoint to that is that there are enough studies out there. There are enough printed materials collecting dust on shelves, talking about racism, talking about the impact, talking about the numbers and why it's important to address it. And so adding to that is not going to make much of a difference. And so we should focus elsewhere. Um, one initiative or one idea uh, was uh, the idea of changing specific steps uh, in dealing with race-related issues. And an example of that would be uh, hate crimes. Um, how do we deal with hate crimes? Um, how are they reported? Um, and what is the police as a frontline um, group or a fr frontline responder, how is the police dealing with it? And we know from experience 
uh, different groups who were subjected to uh, a larger portion of hate crimes. We know that the response is inadequate. We know that at times when there is a spike in hate crimes, as we saw in uh, 2016, for example, and 2017, that the response is weak, that the people who are targeted do not feel supported, let alone protected. Uh, I recall uh, one, uh, uh, one building, a community building, asking that the police just park a car in their parking lot because they're so fearful of, uh, of hate crimes and, and the, the vandalism and the attacks that happen. And they were asking if we could just leave a car in the parking lot whenever you can uh, as a police force. Um, now we can get into anecdotes, but the point is the response has been inadequate. And so one of the ideas uh, that, were, that, that, are, that were pitched was to have hate crimes laid more easily than they currently are. Uh, currently, the attorney general uh, has to have input and the police, as a matter of policy, are not trained and are not advised on laying hate crimes as easily as, for example, other uh, crimes. Uh, as somebody who works in the uh, legal system or the justice system, I can tell you that crimes are laid very easily, particularly against specific groups. Domestic disputes very often lead to the laying of criminal charges, which causes more harm than good, particularly when the situation should be dealt with in a manner other than the use of the criminal law. It's like a, a bull in a china shop in a lot of family situations. And part of that is because, or a large part of that is because the police are trained to lay charges right away as soon as uh, they observe specific facts in even a domestic dispute, whether there are children involved, uh, mothers, fathers, you name it, they lay charges very easily. And so one of the goals uh, that I personally uh, would support uh, is for the police to lay hate crime charges as easily as they lay other charges and let the courts deal with it. That's how we deal with other crimes where uh, I, I don't think it's the right way to go, but I think with hate crimes, it does make sense to uh, turn the tables somewhat and have these uh, charges laid more easily. I will read to you, uh, there was a conference, did anybody attend the anti-racism conference uh, that was held in 2017? <coughs> okay, yeah. excellent. So I'll, I'll read to you really quickly as I, as I wrap up the, the uh, headlines for the um, speaking uh, panels and for the uh, presentations that were made. Uh, there was roots, uh, and I just want you to get an idea of what the focus was like and that things are in the right direction, uh, or at least the, the, uh, the goal is, is a noble one. So the roots of the current state, breaking the silos, starting with the Ontario Public Service, changing the narrative, no data, no problem, the power of media, systemic barriers in schools, justice and systemic racism, and then the future of anti-racism. Now, where that goes is really up to us and is really up to the people that will be involved. Um, as I said, it's brand new, it's 2017. We now have elections. We don't know, obviously, what the result will be, but we can be certain that there will be an impact on this new body uh, depending on the election results. And I, I hate to bring it back to politics, but as much as, as the bureaucrats uh, you know, have, have work to do and, and think that they go back to work regardless, the reality is po politics will shape where this initiative goes. And um, I'm not here to tell people to vote or anything like that, but I think that beyond the elections, <laughs> beyond the elections, we're going to see uh, where a noble initiative like this goes. It, it was a very good initiative, I think. I think it has a lot of room for growth and input. The budget is small, understandably, and whether it grows or shrinks or disappears will depend on really what a lot of us in this room do and outside of this room as well. And uh, okay. I'll, I'll leave it to that uh, for now. I look forward to your questions. Merci Thank beaucoup. You. Thank you, Mohamed. Um, obviously, yes, we are 
now in the middle of, of a provincial election, but in October we'll have a municipal election. And the work uh, also at the municipal level is very important. And I know Noticia uh, works a lot on that area with the city of Toronto to address some of the issue of uh, racism. Uh, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that type of work you're doing, Noticia. Okay, great. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, good morning, everyone. Okay, good. I always say I'm African and we, we specialize in call and response. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was asked to speak about the City of Toronto's anti-black racism strategy and the work of my organization in our participation in that process. Um, so Women's Health and Women's Hands Community Health Center, um, as was stated in the introduction, is the only community health center in North America that specializes in healthcare for racialized women. Um, this is our 25th anniversary, so I'm not necessarily proud to say that this is the only health center that specializes in, in this work, but the existence of our organization speaks against anything that the Canadian government, the provincial government, um, and even the municipal government are putting forward in terms of their excellence, in terms of providing services for racialized members of our communities. And we realized that very early in the development of our organization and um, began participating in international forums. We applied for UN status, ECOSOC status, so that we could have standing um, present, ability to present at the UN, and we're one of the few NGOs in Canada um, for racialized communities that, that do have UN status. But I'm gonna talk to you about our local work, and I think, um, interesting enough, our work internationally and nationally, provincially, has really, um, enabled us to be very proactive in uh, our participation with the anti-black racism strategy for the city because all of the things that we learned in how to push and mobilize governments and work in coalitions actually um, moved us to this, this, uh, this place of, of participation. So I received a call from Ina Nia Ayodeli who was a consultant with the city working on the anti-black racism strategy and asked if our organization would participate in a meaningful way. Um, what that raises for us as an organization and myself as the ED is preparation for exhaustion and frustration. Um, because of the many years of participating in these consultations and trying to push for change and not seeing much happen. So when you make a decision to bring your organization into that process, you're also saying to your whole organization, please get prepared for exhaustion and frustration. Um, but the thing that really pushed us to participate was this one difference, that the city and the consultants and the staff had reviewed 41 years of documented reports that have been submitted to the city by members of the black community, coalitions, and experts. Um, instead of us doing the same thing again, participating in consultations, developing a report that was going nowhere, they were going to review those 41 years of reports, consolidate them, take that information back to the community that exists now and take a look at what were the priorities for the community at this point in time. Um, it's sad to say that 41 years of reports had been submitted to the city with not much being done in terms of anti-black racism. So I asked if I could see the reports before we committed to participating. Um, and what I received was a consolidated version of all of these 41 reports. What I could say from looking at those reports, our organization had participated and consulted into about 20 years of the 41. And I just want to give you a tidbit of what became very um, uh, illuminated for me. In the recommendations, and I'm just going to take one, and this one is very simple. It's around inclusive curriculum in the TDSB. So this is starting in 1975, the first documented report that went to the city. Dr. Wilson Head, and those of you who may or may not know doc, who Dr. Wilson Head is, he was the, the founding director of the Faculty of Social Work at York University, yes. The first director of the Faculty of Social Work was a black man. 
Um, he is the founder, founding director of the Urban Alliance for Race Relations and the co-author of the Ontario Human Rights um, Code. So in 1975, Dr. Wilson had stated, it is recommended that the school boards of Toronto give serious consideration to correcting a long-standing gap in the education of all children. That is the omission of the contributions made by blacks to the growth and development of Canada, 1975. 1992, Stephen Lewis reports, the Minister of Education should begin a series of urgent roundtable meetings with principals, superintendents, and community groups to account to the community for their anti-racism and multiculturalism curricula. In 2008, the Mercury and Curling Report, um, very well known as the Roots of Youth Violence, stated that we should ensure that teachers and administrators better reflect the neighborhoods they serve, develop and provide a curriculum that is culturally and racially inclusive. In 2015, the second African Canadian Summit that was spearheaded by the African Canadian Legal Clinic states in their report, develop a long-term partnership and collaboration between the African Canadian community and the TDSB to develop a culturally responsive and relevant program. In 2016, Anthony Morgan, in his report, states, undertake a comprehensive and properly resourced strategic action plan to make Afrocentric educational opportunities accessible. That's just one recommendation. There are many looking at education, policing, community safety, and I could go on and on, and they all follow the same trajectory, starting in 1975 with Dr. Wilson Head, going up to 2016, so 41 years of recommendations. The city knows what to do. They have it. Um, our participation then became different. Um, as an organization, we first started a series of teach-ins so that we wouldn't become exhausted and frustrated, that we were going to go into this process as an entire organization and be prepared. So our, according to our agenda, so that we were all on the same page, we came up with a series of statements that we would all walk into this process with. Number one, anti-black racism is deeply rooted in historic and ongoing mainstream and racist systems in the city of Toronto. Two, anti-black racism is so deeply entrenched in Canadian institutions that it is invisible to non-black people, thus facilitating our frustration and exhaustion. Three, black communities in Canada are diverse, complex, and have been necessary and essential to the success of this country for over 500 years. The narratives about who we are and our contributions to this country need to shift. We need to be repositioned through federal, provincial, and local apologies for the specific racism that we experience as black people. And the final statement that we walked into this process understanding as an organization was that removing barriers to enable the success of black people should benefit others, particularly our indigenous sisters, and that our work would not be in opposition to the work, but would support the work of our indigenous sisters and their communities. And so we began participating uh, along with other community groups and partnering with the City of Toronto to hold community roundtable discussions. And Women's Health and Women's Hands facilitated specific sessions for women in our communities. And we were very, um, uh, I think, happy to see the level of engagement. We were oversubscribed. We held three sessions. We had a w long waiting list of people wanting to participate and give their opinions about where this black strategy, anti-black racism strategy should, should move to. In total for the entire process, 800 community members participated with organizations across the city. And we gave our feedback on the 41 years of recommendations, acknowledging that it wasn't just about what our issues were. It's about documenting the level of advocacy that the black community has always engaged in. It was about document, documenting our resistance, um, that we weren't always passive participants in our own oppression, 
that we've been actively resisting um, the type of racism that we were experiencing in the city of Toronto. We also wanted to ensure that it was acknowledged that after 41 years of recommendations, the best that this city has been able to offer us is a 13% level of unemployment, 42% of our children were in CAS care, 23% of our children were leaving high school early, and this is down from 48% when we reached the highest and began our, our level of activism around that issue. That 27% of the members of the black community were experiencing carding, and that black women and girls were one of the fastest growing groups of people facing incarceration, and our organization pushed and has pushed for many years for the desegregation of data, um, particularly in the poor health outcomes for people living in the city of Toronto. And we have a saying at Women's Health and Women's Hands that living in Toronto as a black person is very poor for your health. With those consultations, um, the city began to develop what they call subject matter expert tables to take the recommendations and move things forward. And uh, with those subject matter tables, and I had the, the privilege of participating in one, we developed and created a multi-year work plan that identified resources and the requirements to begin implementation of all of the recommendations that the community has given. What I want to emphasize is that the recommendations have not changed in the 41 years. They have remained the same. And with the consultations, all that was highlighted is that this time around, we were more inclusive, that we really acknowledge the diversity of the black community. And even with that acknowledgement, the, the things that we wanted have not changed in any kind of way. But what we have now is more participation of black women in consultations, black youth, the LGBT community, uh, the continental African community, the Muslim community, looking at black communities who have come to Toronto through second migration from Latin America, from Europe. And so I think we have a richer voice in this consultation that happened with the city. The five-year resulting action plan that will be put in place and fully resourced and implemented uh, look at five key issues, children and youth development, health and community services, job opportunities, and income support, policing and the justice system, community engagement, and black leadership. And those are the areas of focus that the new action plan will take place. What the expert uh, panels were able to do is also put in place a mechanism to monitor the success of um, these implemented um, recommendations. And that's what will be going forward in, over the next five years, the implementation. And we will be working with our communities to ensure that we are holding our leaders accountable. Um, I think one of the key things for us to understand is that um, after 41 years of not seeing any change, that the black community is moving and acting in a very different way because we are linking with the provincial strategy. We're linking with a national strategy. We're also linking with our international work and the work um, of Color of Poverty and, uh, and your UN work has been strategic. I think we're in a better place of, of positioning ourselves powerfully and also understanding the need to document not just our historical injustices, but our historical advocacy. And that's what I really appreciated about this process with the city, that we actually can see that over 41 years, the level of engagement the community has had municipally um, without it being supported, acknowledged, and validated um, is something that we're not going to tolerate going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Larissa, if you can talk to us a little bit about the importance of engaging the youth mm -hmm. in this debate around anti-racism and so on and so forth. Perfect. So, thank you, Kia Matien, Larissa Dishnikoshian, Calgary, Toronto, New Ken. 
Hello, good morning. My name is Larissa Crawford. Um, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the land on which you, the University of Toronto sits on um, for thousands of years. It's been the traditional ch territory of the Huron-Wendat, um, the Seneca, and then most recently the Mississaugas of the New Cre of, of Credit River. Um, so I realize that we're over time, so I'm going to make um, my segment as quick and to the point as possible. Um, but I really want to talk about and focus on the how. And um, we talked about at the beginning of the panel, how do we do this? And so I'm going to use two examples from my own experience. Um, first, within the international um, policy advocacy. Um, very relevant to what you were saying earlier. Um, and then within an institutional um, context and pushing forward anti-racism and indigenous um, values and interests. And so I guess my first example is the Y7 Summit. So I recently participated um, in the Y7 Summit, which is a formal um, engagement event, but also delegation to the G7 Summit. Um, and so I was picked to be the head delegate. And so in this process, um, the summit was a three-day event where um, four, four youth delegates from all G7 member countries came together in Ottawa and we negotiated a call to action, so a policy recommendation that is going to be read out loud to all the heads of state of the G7 um, congregation. Uh, we had the chance to speak to ministers. Um, Sophie and Justin Trudeau were really involved. Um, I was able to um, participate with the, y or the W7. Um, and I must say, coming out of this, I have a lot of hope for my generation. Um, the idea of non-binary sexualities, um, gender identities, um, the idea that we have to advocate and pay attention to marginalized communities, indigenous communities, our interests, our needs, our concerns. This was very common sense to the youth in the room negotiating these policy recommendations. We didn't have to fight um, to have these considered. It was just, yeah, of course we have to consider that. So I do have a lot of hope for my generation and the younger generations coming up that um, this fight that we're all in and this advocacy that we're all doing is not going unheard. It's being heard um, by youth. Um, and so especially, and then it's being organized by youth. So the summit was youth organized, and it really provided a space where, um, as you'd said earlier, um, to paint a picture of what's happening within an international context, and then allows us to push a domestic agenda. So at the Y7 summit, the youth who organized this summit really created a space where we could talk about um, our experiences as Indigenous people um, and it, within Canada, the racism that we face, um, the silence that we face. Um, but then we also had a really great opportunity to not only hear about Indigenous people, but for us to speak um, and to really display our culture, our food, our dance, our language. It was a really engaging space that really demonstrated the, the meaningful um, spirit and the true spirit of what inclusion should look like. Um, and so in, in this space, we were really able to push a domestic agenda because we had, um, again, that space to voice um, the issues that we have in Canada. So um, as it, um, I went into the policy recommendations really wanting to advocate um, for water protection. Um, this is coming from a lot of Indigenous, but also racialized communities um, within Canada, but across the world. Um, and so I was able to push an Indigenous agenda within this policy, um, international policy space, um, and it is now included in the text of that policy recommendation that we produced. Um, and so I've spoken again to foreign ministers, um, to the G7 Sherpa, I know, like the Youth Council now has the ear of the G7 Sherpa, and we're really able to push what's going on on the ground, especially within Indigenous activism. Um, to directly to the representative of the head of state within this G7 forum. Um, and so this international space has really given us an opportunity not only to voice what's happening, but also to push that domestic agenda, to push that indigenous, that racialized agenda, especially within um, water protection. And so some challenges that I faced in doing this um, was first, uh, people not understanding who Indigenous people are and our diversity. So obviously I don't look Indigenous. Um, and that was really hard for a lot of people to conceptualize. And so a barrier that I 
faced when going up and speaking um, about indigenous issues or um, about our experiences is that um, in some eyes I lost validity because I didn't look indigenous. And so education and public understanding of who indigenous people are and our diversity, not only that, but also within um, the racialized pockets. We are very diverse within those pockets. It's very common for someone to refer to African and to be everywhere, all Africans. And so um, we really need to educate ourselves, uh, or not ourselves, we're all, I, I'd say, pretty adept to this kind of knowledge, but um, public knowledge of this diversity. Um, people from England who had a degree and master's in history had never heard about the fur trade or didn't understand the violence of colonization of indigenous people in Canada. They were mind blown when they heard what we were speaking about at this summit. And so again, that's going back to education being a huge barrier and ignorance, not always willful ignorance, but the ignorance behind that, those realities. Um, and the education systems failing these people were really behind a lot of the, um, the challenges that I faced. Ministers. I had the opportunity to present the water protection and the indigenous um, domestic agenda to a minister whose job was directly related to water protection. And he had enough knowledge about um, indigenous struggles um, and conflict, but he hadn't heard about Autumn Peltier presenting to the United Nations, calling on all nations to warrior up and give legal rights um, protections to water. He had never heard, he hadn't heard about this. This has been um, splayed across the news for weeks. And so the fact that he had no idea about what was going on was, again, very frustrating. And again, not always willful, but this ignorance was a huge roadblock um, and something that we had to work with. Um, and then again, the international conception of Canada not being, um, not being a racist state. Um, and a, Fran um, a colleague from France, he had said that I had never felt black until I came to Canada. And so he was in Quebec, and it was the first time that he was made to feel different. And he was called out for feeling different. He was from a small town in France. And so that reality really sunk into him, and it, he didn't expect that coming to Canada. And so again, myth-busting this, oh, we're kumbaya here, like, that, that again was the, a huge struggle um, in the international policy. Now, quickly, within the institution, because I found that, the, that pushing an anti-racism uh, agenda was very different from an international context when you're doing it within in, an, within an institution. So at York University, um, I initiated and then um, I've developed the race-based data collection um, for the whole university. So this is the third largest university in Canada. It's a very big project that's going to be affecting every single student coming into York University. Um, and so I've been working with the race, um, race Inclusion and Supportive Environments Committee um, at York University. That's where the committee I've been doing it out of. Um, some of you may know uh, Lauren Foster. He's our, um, he's my mentor, personal friend, but he's also, um, he's also been a lot of, he's also been, had a huge hand in developing this project. Um, we've also worked with the Anti-Racism Directorate of Ontario um, in developing our, um, our census, and so it's called the York Student Identity Census. Um, and so jumping right into the challenges, um, not having diverse senior leadership has been a huge, and one of the only issues that I've found um, with implementing um, this project. And so again, in developing this project, research was very accessible, rationale was very accessible, but once I got into those meetings and those boardrooms, York University has an amazing representation of women um, in our senior leadership. But once you get down to the intersectionality of these women, um, and having to go to these boardrooms and have, having to explain what racism is, and having to really explain what co colorblind ideology is and the issue behind having that, um, it becomes very exhaustive and then it detracts from the conversation of what, how are we doing this um, and going into the action portion of this. And it really, it really highlighted the issue of, yes, 
gender quotas, gender equality um, initiatives are great, but without that intersectional analysis, there's perpetuating um, imbalances and um, subordination of certain groups. We had able-bodied white women in these rooms, which was great, and which on a woman-to-woman -woman basis was really great for me um, to engage with. But once we lost that intersectionality piece, that's when we started hitting roadblocks. Um, and then finally, I guess I'll close off with this, is doing this myself. So um, yes, we have a committee, but I volunteered. I started back in September, I took this project on. Um, and I volunteered up to 30 hours per week since September um, doing this project. And as a full-time student, um, I also have another job, and I have a daughter. Like, this, this is a lot of work. And uh, yes, I've relied on my mentors, but they too, working in anti-racism, working in indigenization, they are also overworked. And so I've seen so many moral commitments to racial equality from institutions. I've seen so many, yes, we want to do this, yes, we want to have all of, these, um, all of these initiatives, but when it comes down to actually evaluating how, the, how well those initiatives are doing into doing the, that anti-racism analysis, that's where we lack, at least from my experience, the commitment, and in a big part, the financial commitment. Um, and I, can, I believe that many of us can attest that people within our, our um, sector of work are very overworked and underpaid. Um, and many people, such as myself, are doing this on a volunteer basis. And so um, one how, a dressel, is that we do need um, those financial commitments from the government, from institutions, um, to be supporting this work. Thank you, Larissa. Thanks a lot. We are really behind our schedule. I think we start a little bit late today and we're almost like half an hour behind. So uh, we're gonna go to a break very soon and the breakout session. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a time for question for our panelists, but I invite you to mingle with them at the break and some of them will be at the breakout session so they will have an opportunity to engage with them. So please join me to thank them all with like a hard applause. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Mohammed, for doing such a wonderful job. What did you call it? Traffic minding. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the panel. You've heard the work that's been, that's been ongoing in building a social justice, racial equity um, agenda. So thank you to our panelists once again. I um, want to remind us all that this gathering is taking place on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the most recent stewards, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. In addition to the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Toronto area is home to many indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We are grateful for this opportunity to meet and work in a good way and in recognizing that there are still locally relevant land claims still going on, in particular, the Toronto Islands. Um, we, we together set an intention and commitment to approach our work in a spirit of real and meaningful reconciliation, equity, and racial justice. And Larissa, thank you for acknowledging the lands before you speak. You spoke. Thank you all for a wonderful panel. We are really behind time. I'm asking you to take five minutes for a refreshment break on your way to your workshops. They're all on the first floor, which is one floor below where we are. There is coffee and tea hopefully left over from this morning. Um, still there. Enjoy your workshops, and we'll see you at lunchtime. <laughs>